This is Dan Vargas. He was born on September 7th, 1944. He served during the Vietnam War in the Air Force. His highest rank achieved was Staff Sergeant. This interview is being conducted in Caledonia, Michigan on May 18th, 2016. The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Just a few biographical details. So where and when you were born? I was born on September 7th, 1944 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then what did your parents do? My parents were immigrants from Mexico. Um, my, uh, my father worked at uh, American Seating in a foundry. My mom worked in a dietary department at St. Mary's Hospital. Did you have any siblings? Yep. I have, uh, I got three sisters, no, four sisters and three brothers. And two, then... bro two other brothers, I take it back. There were seven as in our family. Okay. And then what were you doing before you entered the service? Me, I was going to college. And then did you have any other family members who served in the military? My older brother was uh, in the latter part of World War II. He was a radio operator and a bombardier. He flew out of Italy. Mm -hmm. My younger brother went in the service after a year after I did. He joined it. He was in the Air Force. So how did you enter the service? I was going to college at JC after graduating from, from high school. And in the beginning, I was doing real good in college. It was so easy, I expected it to be real hard, but went to start partying and skipping classes, I was flunking out. So I thought I better do something with myself. So I decided to join the service. You know, at the time, I believe in God, country, and apple pie, that's what I did. I joined the service, but I joined the Air Force because. If I had to join anything, I wanted to get something out of it. And, up, and then what I was told, Air Force when they wanted at least you get a good education out of it. So I wanted to get something that I could do afterwards, so I joined the Air Force. And then what was departure for a training camp like? Oh, departure like? <laughs> we caught a bus, went to Detroit, and uh, we spent the night there. And the next morning, they woke us up. and. Uh, uh, like four o'clock in the morning, and, and I found out what it was a little bit of what was gonna be like the service, and and they march us through for breakfast, and they march us through everything. And I took so many tests all day: blood tests, eye tests, hearing tests, and everything else. So under the sun, till we got done. Once we got done, they put us on a bus, took us to the. Uh, to the airport and then we flew around 11 o'clock at night from Detroit to somewhere to San Antonio, no we stopped somewhere in Kentucky then we landed in uh, Texas early in the morning and the bus picked us up there and all I remember is we were lowered on the bus we are all talking I mean there were one uh, control instructors coming on the bus and first thing he said is all oh, you Blankly blank, shut, you know, blankly blank, your mouth, shut your mouth, and blankly blank, take off those sunglasses. And so we knew where it was, the world was changed. Then we took the bus to the base, so. Did you have any specialized training? And what was it? I mean, uh, I mean, specialized training, no. I took all kinds of tests before I joined the service, so I know I was going to get into a certain field. There was like two or three different fields. Then when I got into after basic training, I they, all, they uh, told me I was going to go to tech school. So. Okay. And then how did you um, adapt to military life? Did you adapt well? <sighs> Once I got over the food, get up early in the morning, people are yelling you left and right, and, you know, and from watching certain parts of movies and all that, what my brother told me and everything else. So. You, you adjust to it. You got no choice. Either adjust to it or I watch people flunk out and I couldn't believe it. It's going to adapt to it. The only thing they home me out is I already knew how to cook and I already knew how to do laundry and everything else. You know, I have four sisters, but it seems like every time when I was younger, when I wanted to date somebody, I wanted a shirt. So I learned how to do wash clothes and how to do how to iron so I would, it didn't bother me. I knew how to make a bed and everything, so it didn't bother me that much in basic. <sighs> Arrived in Vietnam in September of 1968. 
before I went there, uh, I said goodbye to a girlfriend there in the state of Washington. I spent a whole day with her and everything else. She gave me, well, goodbye and everything else. So, anyway, from there we went to Alaska, went to Japan, and from uh, Japan to Atlanta, Vietnam. Oh, before I went, we were supposed to leave at 6 o'clock in the morning, but they had plane trouble, so we didn't leave until 6 o'clock that night. God, and I had slept over 30 some hours. But anyway, once I got to Vietnam and we got there and early in the morning, uh, the break of dawn. I remember getting off the plane. I could not believe the humidity, the stench, and the smell. And, I, and I, that's when I started getting worried and worried about everything. I, I got there and um, I came from Bay, that's what, was, that's what it sent me to. And after a process in, they came and picked me up, took me where I had to go to. Then I went to, I was assigned to a, a direction center. I took care of, a, I was at a comm squadron. Took care of all the information that came in. Uh, everything from uh, Joe, um, Joe Smith or Joe Doe, whatever you want to call him, having a baby to where it was going on on the war. I had a had a top secret clearance, so I, t I, um, I took care of. I had a repaired equipment as it broke down. So I was there for a month. Then I, they shipped me off to a base up Tuliwa, and I was halfway between Cameron Bay and uh, Da Nang. I was, uh, and I was there. I was there for the whole of November of 1968, almost to, almost to almost to Christmas. And then I got shipped back to my base. When I came back, and that's when I missed Bob Hope. Uh, when I landed in the train, they got hit that just as, about an hour before it, and there was smoke and everything all over because uh, they got hit by Sanders. But anyway, so I just saw the results of it and. Uh, from there, once the plane was ready, I landed at a base in Cameron. And when I got there, they told me everything would happen with Bob Oak. I missed Bob Oak by 24 hours. No, yeah, about 12 hours. He was supposed to be there the day before around noon, and he got there at, around midnight because uh, they had a plane trouble and everything else. So they told me all about it, all the trouble they had to go see him. At, and at, Ring cats and dog when he was there, they almost had a riot. So, so I didn't miss anything from Bob Hope. So, when I first got to Vietnam, yes, I was worried. I saw V Kong almost, how can I put it, behind every shadow, everywhere. And I, God, I, I was so worried and everything, I was going nuts. And so Somewhere after I was there, about a month, I finally got through my head where I didn't worry about tomorrow until tomorrow came. I lived just one day at a time. Because every night was like the 4th of July, all around the perimeter. Choppers would be flying around, dropping flares all around. I could hear gunfire every night. Bombs going off in the distance. I could hear outgoing. We used to count how many seconds it was before it, uh, where they were hitting it. So, and finally I got used to it. But when we got hit, it was always between 2 and 4 o'clock in the morning. And I always remember the sounds of the rockets coming in, and I still remember them today. And it took me years after I got back before I could sleep at night with peace and quiet. I could not sleep unless there was noise. And I just put a stack of records on, I'd be sound asleep when the last record finally stopped. I would wake up, it was too quiet, and I would look around because something was wrong. And I finally got used to it. It took me a long time after I got home about it. So, you remember the good times. You remember uh, all the different things you did. Every night somebody was leaving, you know. And we used to have, we had a, a squad right here, we built a little uh, BQ or a little patio deal for everybody to go relax at night or if you wanted to. Or during the daytime, they had food there and you get beer, you could buy beer. Yeah. Cheapest beer, God, I just couldn't believe how cheap things were. I didn't realize taxes were so much. Because you could get cigarettes for 10 cents a pack. 
Do you get a beer? It didn't matter oh, for beer. It didn't matter what beer it was or what kind of or Coke products or Coke Seven Up and all that. These are cost you ten cents a can. So I couldn't believe what you could buy at the BX. You know, I bought my parents and I bought myself a China set which I shipped home. My sisters wanted one and I bought one for them and I shipped them all home. I had a girlfriend, I shipped her a lot of stuff. And I realized, you know, I bought a lot of stuff. And when I was in Tuliwa, I went to the village one time. Then that, that's what I heard. As a crack up, if you argue with people, if they tell you like a ten dollars for something, if you argue with me, I'm surprised you can get the, you can get you can get it for a dollar. I finally learned. I got very very good at it. They used to hate me, but I used to get what I wanted with the price I wanted. You can buy anything you wanted there, and. And it was surprised me along the the road. You could you could get almost anything you wanted, and it was a lot different. For drugs, you can get drugs a lot cheaper there, and you could get cigarettes sometimes. I don't know where they got it from, but you could you could find it. Mama signs there, they could get you anything you wanted. So it was somewhere. It was a lot different. I enjoyed work. I got very good at it. When things broke down, I knew how to fix everything, and and after a while, I was, I was made my own time to do what I wanted to do. I was at a big base when I, when I got shipped back to Cameron. Was doing that, and I got very good at what I did. And I made my own time. When things broke down, I could fix anything. I could fix all my equipment, no problem at all. Sometimes. I got uh, used to get in arguments with uh, officers and all them, but they left me alone because I could fix it and do what I wanted to do. I could take care of the equipment. That's all that mattered to them. And so, and I enjoyed it. And then we had a big base. Sometimes you wonder how could that place be like that? It, they had everything there for you. They were building the gym. I play softball, I play basketball, and everything through my through my own time and everything else. But, eh, but to call home, it was very hard. You had uh, you had to go down to Saigon or somewhere where you can get to uh, to a phone and it cost you. I remember it was uh, eight, 90 bucks a minute that cost it cost you. I went to Saigon about three different times to get equipment, man. A couple times just to get out where I was because we were confined to a base. We really were not allowed to leave. We were uh, Saigon. I could not believe the place. It seems like I never seen so many motorbikes or scooters, whatever you want to call them, everything else, and. I, I, it is a down on me like every other corner be be a pillbox with a machine gun, and if they had a scooter, they would never pull over or they used to cut you off unless you had something bigger than what they had, and then it would give you the right away. Be a stop light and then a, or a stop sign wherever it was, or the light or change, and everybody be accidents left over, left and right, and people just drive over each other. But come nighttime. I could not believe it. I never heard so many bombs, gunfire, and everything go off in my life. God, I was there. That was another time I got so scared. I just come. I thought I was gonna die there. And when I, I just couldn't believe all the action was going around all over the place. The place I was at, and then the building be shaking left and right, be gunfire, not like I was next door. I was so afraid to go to sleep that I was never gonna wake up. But you know. Come morning, everybody. I, I don't know where it was, but I could find my way back to the base and just follow everybody else. But like I said, I went there about three different times and it was different. They had this rich area and they had this poor area like like any other city. And I enjoyed it. I remember going to one place, everybody was all the servants and everything were they all had like all in white and everything else they wanted. And it was a, here I am taking a bath in two or three days and I smell so bad and they want to serve me. I was, like, I was so embarrassed to go in there and they want to. So, so I didn't.
I went somewhere else. So I so felt more comfortable. And uh, stories, I don't know. You, you remember good times. I remember, remember the base, in the middle of the base, they had a, like a, a little sand lot. Somebody put up a big screen and we used to watch movies at night. And I seen, I thought it was so funny that all around the base to be flares going off, gunfire, gunfire be going off, bombs going off, and here we were watching some dumb, stupid movie. And, you know, but all they had are like a benches, so we used to go there every night. They showed a different movie, and then I thought it was kind of crazy and dumb. Every night they wanted to go see a movie. It didn't matter if it rained or what through the monsoons or whatever it was. So we put put a poncho on, carry a deal, carry a a deal of beer and everything. We go watch a movie every night. <laughs> that was so funny. I remember watching one night. We were watching uh, uh, Gregory Peck to kill a mockingbird. I, re I remember that. They're in the middle of his trial scene. Next thing you know, the lights lit up like it was daylight here was the middle of the night watching like you know watching a movie and we got hit left and right and i never seen people scramble run so much on their lives and just scatter everywhere and i i didn't think it was funny at the time but afterwards i do remember and and, and afterwards i thought about it and it was funnier in the heck i said you gotta be kidding me here you know it says why we never got hit before i don't know we used to get hit now and then. I got used to it where when we got hit, and I remember the rockets coming in. If they weren't close enough, because most of the time they went for the earth strip. If they weren't close enough, we just roll over and go back to bed. And I never got worried until I had about two weeks to go. I remember one night, I could hear the sirens, I could hear the streak of the rockets coming in. I said, oh my God. I looked outside and it was raining cats and dogs and I said, what the heck? And then I started yelling, we're, gonna, we're getting hit. It was like 2.30 in the morning. We're getting hit, we're getting hit. And I started running out and the guy said, where are you going? He says, we're getting hit. He said, there ain't close enough. You've been here long enough. And I said, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. And he said, I, I got. Then I climbed back to bed and went back to sleep, but I, I stayed up all night. But, but the rock is in the, where we got hit wasn't close enough. I should have known better. I've been there long enough. But as for the weather, it was so hot and so humid. God, I could not sleep at night. We slept in barracks, so I had a little bit better off than the other people. Um, the people that were out beating the bushes. But I remember going through, uh, it was so hot, I, I could not sleep unless I sweated so much that my sheets got so wet to, to a little bit where it cooled off that I could sleep and I could sleep at night. I went through two, uh, two typhoons and God, I just could not believe that it could rain that much. I guess you should have known, that's like a hurricane. I shouldn't have realized, but man, it rained until, I never saw it rain that much again until, forgot when it was, when the monsoons came in, and when it came in, well, it rained every day for a long time. But through the typhoons, I remember for three or four days at a crack, I went through one, and uh, two weeks later, went through another one. It rained so hard, it was like somebody turned on a faucet. It didn't matter what you were or what it was, that you got wet. And it rained and rained. It's like somebody turned on the water. It didn't matter what you had on, you were just wet. And you just got used to it. And so, other than that, like I said, and then you just took one day at a time. I didn't worry about tomorrow until tomorrow came. When my time came, I went to Thailand. And a buddy of mine, he was in the Army. We were together in Minnesota for a little he went to Thailand, I went to Vietnam. We, we went through the same training. And he got a hold of me one night and he says, come on over and he says, I'll take care of you. I got you all set up with everything, the party and everything else. Because I was young, single and everything else. But I kind of wanted to go to Australia sometimes. I wish I would have went, but I, that's life. I didn't do it. 
And if I don't went to Hawaii, I probably would have got married. But I didn't go. So I went to I went to Thailand where he was at, and I don't regret going. I had a great time. For seven days, I didn't worry about nothing because I knew where I had to go back to. I enjoyed myself. I party for seven days, and I enjoyed it. And so I had no regrets what I did and everything else. So other than that, you know. We just live one day at a time and we just count the days. Every day he had a little calendar and says, Good morning, Mr. Vargas, and it says you have so many days left before you're out, you know. I was always gonna get out of service. And the only thing that went wrong is right at the end. I can't tell you everything what happened, but and uh, my first sergeant, the guy who was in charge of me in my department. When Camille hit, Miss, uh, hit um, Mississippi, he lost his trailer, lost everything. That was August of 1969. So he took a they sent him home medical leave because he lost everything. Because of that, they brought somebody else in. And because of that, they were going to extend me six months in Vietnam. And I didn't know that until I was ready to leave. My first sergeant came and talked to me. He says, you like your commander, but you don't know what he was trying to do. He tried to keep you here for another six months because uh, the other guy had leaving. They wanted you. And the only reason they couldn't do it was I went to Vietnam in an extension. So I extended the service. If I wouldn't extend it, I would have been there another six months because that, that's what got me out. And I was kind of grateful because I knew they were short what I did. So. When the time was up, I was happy, and, I, and then when I came home, I got out of the service. I almost ex enlisted, but I thought about it. But if I did, I know I'd be back in Vietnam within a year, and I didn't want to go back anymore. I don't ever regret going, because I saw what it was a little bit like. I got everything out of my system, but I didn't. Want, I wouldn't want to do it again. I visit a couple of villages, so I know a little bit. Plus, I went to Saigon, went to the train, went to Fame Rang, and went to uh, the, yeah, on the train, Tuliwa, a couple other places. But it's not what I wanted. It's not where I wanted to be. So, so when time came, I just lived, lived one day at a time. I never got worried until I got close. Once I got close. Then I was like when I first got there. I got scared every night. I was afraid of every shadow. I was afraid of everything until it was time to leave. And then I remember every night we'd go there to the patio. We'd be drinking beer and you know singing songs and everything else. And they'd be singing short, short. We got to get out of this place. I sort of remember. And I finally was on when I was leaving next day. I was yelling, screaming. Was I thought I was so short. Find some guy next to me. Always, I never forgot. And he says, uh, "When are you leaving?" I says, "Tomorrow." I'm so short. He says, "What time?" I told him six o'clock. And the sucker told me he was leaving at noon. God, it made me so mad that somebody was shorter than I was. He was leaving at noon. I was leaving at six o'clock that night. So that's the way things went. And so, and you mean. You got to know people and everything else. Made a lot of friends. I kept track track of them a little while. Some came and visited me when they got out and everything else, but we lost track. But somewhere down the road, we're getting back together again. So it was different. It was an experience. So I don't know what more to say. The food, <laughs> depending on where you were. When I was at Cameron, the food was. Terrible was there. Um, I don't know where the NCOs, the higher ranky, left, but the peons and all this from staff sergeant down where we ate. God, it was a big commissary. Just went there and ate. The food was bad, bad. When I went to Tuliwa, because my rank is since I was a sergeant, I got to eat this one place. The one uh, was a smaller base. And the food was. Surprising, it was very, very good, and I enjoyed it. I used to have uh, roast beef or uh, roast pork every night, or something with mashed potatoes and everything else, and that was good. 
and two guys under me and they told me come eat with us and I went ate with the peons that ate or the lower rank God I swear to God I saw cockroaches and everything coming out of the food uh, on the place and everything on the food was so bad and I said I says I love you guys but I'm gonna go eat where, where the other people are you know so I went went back where I was but that was different everybody cared and everybody took care of each other and everybody helped each other so, so I'll admit, so, I'll admit, so that's what I remember. I was at a big base where by the beach. So there was, uh, you could just walk over between the dealers and go out and go swimming on uh, the Gulf of Tonkin every day if you wanted to. And a lot of guys did and I did too. I was drawn it there one time, I got caught in under toes, but. Some guy pulled me out and saved my life, I remember, but I remember he'd go out there every day and swim. And it was a big base, and then all kinds of supporting dudes around, around us. So, but I remember one time we got hit, about two or three of them got wiped out. That's a, that I do remember. Uh, so it was like everything else he didn't. It was almost like going to work every day. You know, Except for me, I was on call 24 hours a day because of what I did with the equipment I took care of it was that important and most of the time you, you just stay free do whatever you wanted to do it didn't care so I did what I wanted to do you know taped a lot of music and wrote letters home and everything else my folks were always worried my mom was the most worried about everything she didn't want me to go and she cried every day I was there so I wrote her almost every chance I got to tell her I was safe and everything else. So, so I had a girlfriend, yeah, and she wrote everything. And we just sent tapes back and forth. So that was different. Technology was beginning to change a little bit. So, well, when my time's up, I only had to be there one year. So when time came in uh, September 1969, I caught a plane and went through Tokyo and I landed in Seattle. There I spent the night there and I processed out. And the next day, instead of coming home, I went and saw my girlfriend there in, in the Twin Cities. I stayed with her and her family for a week because I knew I was gone 13 months from her. After 11 months, I knew something was wrong and I tried to patch things up, but it did not happen. In the meantime, I got offered a job there in Minnesota with a computer company. So I went home, waited for my whole baggage and everything to come in from overseas. Then I moved back to then I moved to Minnesota one for the job two. Hopefully, I could get the girl back, which didn't happen. I met my wife nine months later in the hospital. She was my nurse. She took care of me when I was getting my appendix out. That's why I met her. But. Came home, my mom was so happy and everything else, and she was so worried because I was so, she says, I lost so much weight. God, I think I was home for about three weeks between my search law and my mom and everything else. I think I gained 20 pounds. They fed me every day. God, I go nuts down. And it was, it was different. It was different where it took me a while to get used to being quiet. Or being being peaceful again. I lost something over there in um, like uh, time stood still. When I was there, it seemed like time stood still. And when I came back, it seemed like the world took one step ahead, and I was one step behind. And it took me a long time where I had the cockiness, the sureness, everything that I had before I went. I I was so I know what I. I was so, uh, how can I say, I was such a, like a leader, I could do what I wanted to do and everybody would follow. It took me a while to get that back. I lost a lot, when I, I don't know why I did, but I did. It took me a while to get where I felt everything was back to normal. So, as for friends, yeah, I kept track of my friends. They wrote me when they were overseas, when they came back home, they all came visit and everything. We had a party and everything else. By that time, I was ready to get married and I got married afterwards. Then I kept track of a lot of them. One became my roommate for a long time until I got married and he moved out to California. And 
So now for reunion, yeah, I'm going to one this June. Come June, I'm going to somewhere in Ohio. They're having a big reunion for all the people who are stationed at radar sites here in the USA and overseas. And I was stationed at three of them. I was stationed at one in California, one in Washington, one in Maine. So, so I was invited to join them for the big reunion, which I'm going to win uh, next month in June. They're somewhere in Ohio. So are you in any like veterans organizations? Yeah. Uh, when I was in Minnesota, hey people, uh, I was playing softball and everything else. These guys wanted me to play ball with them. So, but in order for me to play with them, I had to join the VFW. So I joined the VFW so I could play ball with them. And I could not believe there was a lot of them. And if they're in the Twin Cities, we just go to places somewhere. God, they were so plush, water walk carpeting, they were so nice. Another ones were, God, like a run down trailer, and the big dad was a post, and that sort of what. But we used to have so much fun. My, uh, my fiance, Judy, was the one girl I ended up getting married to. She'd come to all my games, and she, we enjoyed it. That was the best summer I enjoyed playing ball and everything else, going to all these. Uh, VFWs all over the place playing ball and everything else and so I became a member when I came home when I got offered a job back home in Grand Rapids when I moved back in uh, 71 I joined a VFW I, am, I was working for a computer company and when a company went folded and everything else and when you didn't quite have enough money and the people in the VFWs they paid my deal for one year and after that I says I will be guys so after that I became a lifetime member so all this been uh, care for the VFW for veterans and all this anything I could do all this try out them excuse me and now, now I'm retired and everything else I, I became a volunteer and work at the VA so I'm trying to help veterans I always have a heart for veterans you know Anybody who gives their time for the military deserves some. So. Well, that's different. It's before I went over there, I used to believe in God, country, and apple pie, and I lost a lot of over there. It is. I couldn't understand how the war was going. I couldn't understand how we could take a place, turn around, give it back come back two or three weeks later, take it back again, turn around a month later, give it back, and come back another month later and take, retake it again. And in the process you lose maybe one guy, the next you lose ten, the next day you lose a hundred. And, that, and that, that didn't make no sense to me. They didn't understand where every time we got hit they knew where it came from. But they weren't because of politics, religious deal, they were not allowed to go in there and do anything about it. And half the time, when he saw somebody, you can't shoot him unless they shot first. And that did not make sense. It didn't make sense what was going up north with the bombing raids and everything else. You know, there'd be a bridge. Instead of blowing the whole bridge, you're only allowed to bomb one span. And that, that did not make sense. And after coming home, everybody calling you baby killers to everything else. And, you know be mad with you because you military and everything else you know so I lost a lot and I always wonder wonder and then and that took me a while and I finally got over it and so I don't blame I used to hate Vietnamese and I used to hate everybody but now I got far maybe I got pacifist maybe where <sighs> I don't hate anybody anymore. I don't blame the people. They believe what they want to do, so they went to Canada. So I don't regret them from going. So I have friends I went to school with. Some got married, so they didn't have to go into service. So you know, and that's like me. You know, when I was going to college, when I was flunking out, so I thought I'd join before I got drafted. So I always was grateful when I was not carrying a uh, carrying a rifle, beating the bushes. You know. So that I, I, I don't regret. I was always happy with. I did what I had to do and I did my tie and I did it the best of my ability. You know. 
The only time I was worried one time when I was um, I was there about two weeks. Then they said since you guys are new people, or your job is this to give his rifles and everything else, which is fine, Danny. He was I don't know what shoot one. They put us one corner of the perimeter and it says in case we ever get attacked, wherever it was, your job is to guard this part of the airstrip. I sat there about three or four minutes and I, then it finally dawned on me. It says, God, you got to be kidding me. If it gets to the point where depending on us to guard this part of the, air, the airstrip, I might as well kiss my ass and it's going to be goodbye because all that they can do is stop long enough to reload and keep on we ain't gonna stop nobody you know we're dead as can be so I, once I got over that fact I said you gotta be kidding we're gonna be dead dead for just to that point you know so and but for the service you know and I don't regret going there because it gave me give me time to grow up and give me time to get everything out of my system that's why I went in I went in a, get an education on something and get everything out of my system and grow up and enjoy life. So for that fact, I, I didn't want to get stationed at home where a lot of people want to get stationed in Michigan. Me, I want to see the world. So for that fact, I don't regret. I got to see everything I wanted to see. I didn't quite go everywhere I wanted to go, but I got to see all 48 states plus I got to see Thailand, I got to see Vietnam and all that. So. I can't complain that much. The only thing I regret when is when I flew over Tokyo both times, Japan. Because of the engine trouble, we flew over there at 2 o'clock in the morning, landed up base outside at 2 o'clock morning where we refueled, we were not allowed to leave. And the same way when we came back, I landed in Tokyo at 2 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't see nothing so other than the lights, and it was a big city. We we're not allowed to be the base, so that was different, you know. So for that, that's the only thing I regret I was not to see Tokyo see what it was like, you know, so but everything I did see, so I don't regret anything. And the service in the, is became a sub teacher. Uh, when I came back I used a GI Bill which was available to me and it took me nine years to graduate from JC and to graduate from Aquinas. I got my business degree which helped me out. Once I retired I always wanted to be a teacher, so I got it out of my system. So I, I was a sub teacher for 10 years. I don't regret, and I used to tell kids, it's just, life is there, it's hard. And I used to tell them, if you don't know what you want to do, join the service. But remember, there might, there's a good chance to get education, you can get, save money, you can go to college later. But remember, is is they might not send you where you want to go and you might not do what you want to do so as long as you're willing to accept the consequences do it because everything's there for you if you join the right branch you can get a good education you can get whatever you want it's there for you but just remember once in a while if it's peach time it might be great but if a war pops up they're going to send you somewhere you might not want to go and you just have to endure it and do the best you can, you know. It's just, the only way to survive is I live one day at a time, did not worry about tomorrow until tomorrow came. Okay.